Hello again, we're going to talk about some of the GI disorders of the newborn. I've split this up into a few sections. Uh, we're pretty much only going to talk about uh, problems, GI problems, that affect uh, the newborn uh, in the first four weeks uh, of life. So there's some that you may think are left out. I will address those later on when we talk about pediatric GI disorders in general. Uh, so there are a lot of newborn GI disorders. Uh, and uh, a lot of these can present with failure to pass meconium. And passing meconium is something that you should see within 24 hours in the healthy newborn. Uh, more than 99% of all newborns will pass meconium in the first 24 hours. So if there hasn't been uh, a meconium passage within 24 hours, you should start to think of the possibility of some of these things that are uh, highlighted in green. Uh, P passing meconium is a, uh, a hallmark sign of GI health. So the first one we're going to talk about is esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula. There's four variants of this that are seen clinically, um, but there's one that's most common, and that's going to be a proximal esophageal atresia with a distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Uh, however, they all involve an incomplete formation of the esophagus. Uh, whether or not they include a tracheoesophageal fistula or where the esophageal atresia is if it's, uh, if it's proximal or distal. Now, tracheoesophageal fistula makes up the T and E of the vectoral sequence. And vectoral is vertebral anomalies, uh, imperforate anus, cardiac defects, tracheoesophageal fistula, renal defects, and limb anomalies. Now, some of these things you'll see uh, just doing an exam on the baby, uh, such as limb anomalies and imperforate anus and possibly even vertebral anomalies, but the renal defects and cardiac defects are things that you probably wouldn't see unless you do labs or get an echocardiogram. So certainly in all patients, all babies that have anything within the vectoral sequence, uh, but particularly esophageal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula, you're going to want to make sure that an echocardiogram is part of your management. Even though an echocardiogram doesn't do anything for the esophageal atresia, obviously, uh, you want to make sure that these babies aren't sent off with some kind of cardiac defect because then they can present later in a much more compromised situation. The symptoms for esophageal atresia are, uh, they're going to present early on. So you can imagine that if you have a blind pouch in your esophagus and uh, what's going to happen, that's not going to go through the stomach and on through the intestines, that's going to come right back up the, uh, the, the uh, esophagus and the oropharynx. And so the problem is that this can get regurgitated and then subsequently aspirated. So uh, this will typically present as respiratory distress shortly after birth. The baby should feed within about six hours after birth. Uh, and this will worsen the more the baby feeds. Uh, you'll also see regurgitation. The baby will salivate, again, because the baby can't swallow the saliva. So the saliva is just going to come out the mouth. So you'll see that drooling. And then uh, you can also see signs of aspiration pneumonia uh, if this has festered for a while. Uh, so that could be fever, tachypnea, lung sounds, adventitious lung sounds. Um, and then uh, if you uh, were to pass an NG tube down, which is actually going to be part of your diagnosis, you would note that you'll hit resistance early on. Another thing that's important in this is that oftentimes the mother will have a uh, history of polyhydramnios in her pregnancy. Uh, so this would be a baby that is delivered to a mother who uh, had polyhydramnios. For diagnosis, you're going to pass that NG tube down uh, until you hit resistance, and then you're going to get a plain film. Uh, so you can call that a chest x-ray or an abdominal x-ray. The baby is pretty small, so you place them on the, uh, on the, uh, on the table for the, uh, for the x-ray. You're really pretty much taking an x-ray of the whole baby. Uh, they call it a baby gram. Uh, so you'll get a plain film with the NG tube passed, and what you'll see is that the NG tube will be coiled in, uh, it, before it would reach the stomach, uh, and so you'll note the blind upper pouch, and that'll be in 92% of cases. Um, you should also get an echocardiogram as well as part of your clinical workup. So here's uh, the, some of the uh, variants of congenital esophageal anomalies. So these are the 92% of cases in which you'll see the coiled up tube, and that's because you have a proximal blind pouch. So here and here, and you would see that NG tube coiled up here. Uh, 
in the vast majority of cases, there will be a, uh, a distal tracheoesophageal fistula, which is a communication between the distal esophagus and the respiratory tract, but in 7% of cases, that won't be present. Uh, the other 7% of cases, uh, you can have a tracheoesophageal fistula without atresia. So you can imagine in this case, the baby will be able to swallow things, will be able to feed, but the baby will have respiratory distress because of the fistulization and the, uh, and the pneumonia that would develop from this. Uh, and then uh, likewise, uh, in the esophageal atresia with proximal tracheoesophageal fistula, the baby's going to be swallowing contents and it's going to go into the lung cavity rather than uh, into the stomach. Uh, so that, that's, that would be very problematic as well. So the one you need to be most concerned about, though, is the esophageal atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula. That's going to be the one that board is going to test in the USMLE. So the management here is consultation with pediatric surgeon. They're going to be the ones that repair this. You're going to get NG decompression. You want to get everything out of, that, of the esophagus uh, that's in there because all of that stuff can be uh, regurgitated and aspirated. And you, you don't want to uh, have any more aspiration than you've already had. The baby's going to be NPO. You'll give them IV fluids, IV nutrition. You could also do a gastrostomy uh, because the baby's stomach is fine. So in either in uh, one, two, or three here, uh, gastrostomy would be perfectly fine because there's nothing wrong with the rest of the GI tract. I suppose you could do it in three here too, as long as you have a, a good valve here. So um, gastrostomy is another, uh, another option, you don't have to go TPN. IV antibiotics would be good uh, if you suspect uh, aspiration, and then echocardiogram, of course, is important because of the bacterial sequence and the risk of concurrent uh, uh, heart defects. And then the definitive treatment is surgical repair, and this needs to be done relatively quickly. Duodenal atresia is a congenital absence or a complete closure of part of the duodenal lumen. And this defect typically occurs uh, in association with trisomies, cardiac lesions, and the bacterial sequence. This a lot of times is detected uh, antenatally or an ultrasound, and you should certainly consider this, again, with polyhydramnios. Remember, how does polyhydramnios happen? Uh, how does it happen? It happens because the baby is not able to swallow the fluid, uh, the amniotic fluid, and therefore uh, the amniotic fluid is going to collect. Uh, so uh, you should consider this, especially in babies born to mothers with polyhydramnios. This presents very similarly to esophageal atresia. Uh, however, uh, you may get bilious vomiting here, uh, but it may be non-bilious vomiting. It really uh, depends. Um, you can also get uh, failure to pass meconium, but you can't necessarily rely on that just because of how proximal this is. You can also have a distended abdomen, but typically uh, the abdomen is not as distended uh, as it would be for more distal lesions. So when you compare some of these more proximal lesions like duodenal atresia uh, compared to more distal lesions like Hirschsprung's disease, uh, you'll see a... Uh, a um, a continuum that the more proximal lesions are going to present earlier and there's going to be less bloating, less distension, the more distal lesions are going to present later and there's going to be more distension. And the reason for that is the further down the GI tract the lesion is, the obstruction is, the more uh, intestine there is available to become distended, and so the baby can become more distended. But at the same time, it takes a little bit longer uh, for anything that's eaten, drinking, uh, for formula or breast milk to get to that point of, uh, of obstruction. Uh, so uh, these proximal lesion babies like duodenal atresia, they're going to present earlier, but they're going to have a less distended abdomen, uh, whereas with Things like Hirschsprung's disease, they'll present a little bit later, uh, but they'll have a much more distended abdomen when they present. That's generally the rule of thumb. So the diagnosis here is going to be to get an abdominal x-ray, and that will classically show the double bubble sign. And the double bubble sign is uh, two lumens uh, that you'll be able to see uh, appear dilated here. Uh, the one on the left is the stomach, and then the one on the right here is the duodenum. So here's your two bubbles. 
So your management again here is going to be a, uh, first to get a pediatric surgery consult. You're going to want to do NG decompression. You don't want these babies to be uh, to, to be eating or drinking anything. Um, and then uh, you may defer surgery if there are other uh, more life-threatening complications present, and that's certainly possible because uh, duodenal atresia uh, can often happen in uh, in concurrence with other uh, with other uh, congenital anomalies. Uh, but if you do defer surgery, you should get a contrast enema to rule out malrotation. And the reason you want to rule out malrotation is because uh, malrotation can uh, appear very similar on x-ray to duodenal atresia. If you think about malrotation, where the lesion is, it's at the duodenum if you have a volvulus. And so if you were to have a volvulus, you would have a double bubble sign because you have an obstruction in the duodenum and it would look pretty similar to, uh, to uh, duodenal atresia. So you want to rule out malrotation uh, if you're going to defer the surgery. Otherwise, you're just going to get a corrective surgery, uh, which is a duodeno-duodenostomy. Postoperatively, you'll observe these babies and continue parenteral nutrition uh, until their first stool is passed. Uh, and you should also uh, have prophylactic antibiotics uh, on board uh, just because of the risk of the uh, of the uh, of the new uh, lumen uh, uh, becoming infected. Uh, also, a good thing to note, another thing that can look like duodenal atresia is annular pancreas. Uh, you can diagnose this sonographically, uh, however, usually it's found during surgery, and that's perfectly fine. The management is going to be the exact same. It's going to be a duodeno-duodenostomy. But one thing that's really important is that you know you never divide the annular pancreas. You're not going to cut that pancreas that's 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 constricting the duodenum because uh, that would lead to worse problems. Uh, so if you ever get asked what the management for uh, duodeno duodenost or sorry for annular pancreas is, it's going to be a duodeno duodenostomy. Not you're not cutting the annular pancreas. So intestinal atresia uh, is going to be atresia of anywhere of the GI tract uh, that's distal to the duodenum. Uh, so we're talking here uh, the jejunum, ileum, and uh, the bowel, uh, large bowel. Uh, typically these are caused by vascular accidents and they're less associated with congenital conditions. I should say vascular accidents that happen very early on in gestation. 10% of these are associated with cystic fibrosis. Symptom-wise, these are similar to duodenal atresia. These are always going to have bilious vomiting because the obstruction is, uh, is distal. Uh, to the ampulla. Uh, these babies will also tend to have failure to pass meconium. Uh, they'll also have uh, more uh, uh, distinguished abdominal distension uh, compared to duodenal atresia. And like I said, the severity of the distension is proportional to how far the obstruction is down the GI tract. Again, the best initial diagnostic test is an abdominal x-ray and the suspicion to the location can be based off of the radiographic appearance. With this, you're not going to see a double bubble sign. You're going to see multiple dilated loops of small bowel. And you can uh, go on to further uh, decide how far this is down by getting a contrast enema. And uh, when you get the contrast enema, you should be able to, or I suppose you could also get an upper GI sequence as well. Uh, but when you get that, you'll be able to see the transition zone, and that will help you determine where the... Uh, where the obstruction is. So the management is similar. Again, you want pediatric surgery on board, you get NGD compression, IV fluids and nutrition, and then a corrective surgery based on the surgeon's preference. There's lots of different types of surgery uh, depend on, depending on what the surgeon is uh, knows how to do, uh, feels comfortable with, and also where the obstruction is. Uh, the post-op care is similar to du duodenal atresia. You want uh, parenteral nutrition until first stool is passed, as well as prophylactic antibiotics. So here's uh, some x-rays uh, of intestinal atresia. So this would be a, a jejunal atresia, and it doesn't always on x-ray give you this, but with jejunal atresia, you tend to see this triple bubble sign. So you have You've got this, uh, your stomach here, your duodenum here, and then your jejunum down here. Uh, but 
if it's more distal, uh, you can, and certainly if it, even if it's in the uh, jejunum, you can also see these multiple dilated loops of small bowel as well. If you get a contrast enema, what you sh certainly should do um, any, uh, with, with any kind of uh, uh, disease of the small bowel or colonic atresia, uh, you will see a microcolon. Okay, so this one is a little different in that uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis tends to present after the baby has been discharged and it also is not as associated with congenital illnesses like the previous ones are. So this tends to present between two weeks and two months of life and it also has a tendency to happen in firstborn males uh, and males in general uh, on a four to one uh, ratio as well as in uh, babies who are born to parents with a history of HPS. And what this is is it's a hypertrophy of the muscular layer of the pylorus which is the end of the stomach uh, resulting in a gastric outlet syndrome in which the baby is not able to get contents from the stomach into the duodenum and so the result is going to be non-bilious vomiting followed by a desire to feed because the baby's still hungry. The baby's not actually absorbing any of the uh, breast milk or the formula that's being fed. Uh, and notably this is a projectile non-bilious vomiting because you have a lot of muscle uh, in, in, in the pylorus. This is a hypertrophied muscular layer. So you'll get the projectile non-bilious vomiting. If there's ever bile in the vomiting, this is not a, a, an obstruction anywhere proximally. It's not in the stomach. It's not in the first couple parts of the duodenum. It's, it's uh, much further down, distal to the ampulla. So this is a projectile non-bilious vomiting followed by a desire to feed. The baby's still hungry. You'll also have uh, a baby with symptoms consistent with dehydration because the baby's throwing up, the baby's not able to absorb any fluids, uh, and a lot of times the mother will say, my baby's constipated because my baby is not making any poopy diapers, my baby's not making any wet diapers, and so the mothers will say, my baby's constipated because I haven't been having to change the diapers. Uh, that may be one way that the mother describes it. Uh, labs, uh, which you should certainly get in any baby who's had uh, significant vomiting, will be consistent with uh, persistent vomiting, just like we would see in anybody else, a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, because you're losing uh, chloride and uh, potassium uh, in the vomitus. If you do your physical exam, uh, you should be able to palpate an olive-like nodular mass over the uh, sort of the center, more to the, towards the right, uh, right upper quadrant area. But you can't rely on this olive-like nodular mass uh, for diagnosis. So the absence of this does not necessarily rule out HPS, but its presence certainly suggests it. For diagnosis, uh, you can get uh, either abdominal sonography, if you're familiar with the exam, otherwise get an upper GI contrast study. Uh, I would say going with an upper GI contrast study would be the right answer on the USMLE. Remember that sonography is dependent on how, uh, how familiar the uh, operator is with it. With an upper GI contrast study, it's very difficult to go wrong. Uh, so with that upper GI contrast study, you'll see the transition zone right in between the stomach and the duodenum. And that will help you confirm your diagnosis. So here's your, uh, here's your uh, stomach here, and then this transition zone, and this is the pylorus here. That's hypertrophied, and this is the beginning of the duodenum. You can see it again here. So this sort of apple core here. The management is going to be, again, to call a pediatric surgeon. You can probably see a theme here. Uh, the best first step is to correct dehydration and electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities. This is typically going to involve getting the baby fluids, giving the baby uh, potassium. Uh, and the reason for this is that a surgeon is going to be very, very, very hesitant to cut into anybody that is unstable, be it metabolically, uh, be it electrolytes, uh, be it uh, blood pressure, you name it. So you want to get the baby stable. This isn't an emergent condition. Uh, as long as you're treating the baby's dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities, 
Um, you'll also want to monitor the urinary output. That's sort of your uh, that, that's sort of your tell that you know the baby is getting adequate hydration. Once the baby is normal uh, and uh, well hydrated and has uh, normal metabolic profiles, then you can send the baby off to surgery. It's going to be a pyloromyotomy, uh, which is an incision of the serosa over the pylorus. This divides the antrum, um, and uh, that typically will uh, help, the, um, help the contents get into the duodenum. After surgery, you can start liquids, oral feeds at four to six hours, and then uh, full feeds at 24 hours, barring any con uh, complications. Some complications that can occur, uh, post-operative vomiting, that tends to be the norm. This is self-limiting, you don't have to do anything for that. Uh, major complications, however, are apnea, so you should have all these babies on an apnea monitor, uh, preferably in a, in a NICU or a PICU, uh, depending on their age. And then um, it is also possible to have duodenal or gastric perforation during surgery. If that happens, then you should get IV antibiotics and NGD compression uh, to uh, manage that. Male rotation and volvulus. So this is a uh, this is a very very big problem. Uh, not so much the male rotation of itself, but the volvulus that can uh, come about from this. So this is a problem that occurs or originates during the early part of fetal development, uh, in as much as the bowel does not uh, completely rotate uh, into its proper position during fetal development. So the bowel is not in its normal anatomic position. And these fibrotic bands will cover part of the small intestine. These fibrotic bands are a normal part of the anatomy, but because the intestines are not in their normal spot, these fibrotic bands become problematic uh, because uh, they're, uh, they're over intestines that are not where they should, and so they can cause obstruction. 70 to 90 percent of cases are diagnosed within the first year of life, uh, and I would say uh, that a uh, similar proportion even earlier than that. Uh, major complications from this, obviously intestinal obstruction, that's typically due to those fibrotic bands, known as LADS bands, and then the really big one that we're concerned about because this leads to so much morbidity and mortality, the midgut volvulus, and that happens because uh, this bowel is loose, and it is really hinging on this superior mesenteric artery. And that artery happens to be very, very important because this feeds the entire small bowel and the large bowel all the way down to the sigmoid, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but it, uh, it feeds a lot of bowel. And so uh, if there is ischemia uh, from, this, uh, from this artery, you can have uh, a lot of necrosis and further complications. So the symptoms here are going to be uh, what you would see with any obstruction, bilious vomiting, bloating, distension, um, and then if there's volvulus, uh, there can be fever, uh, nausea, vomiting, blood streak stools, uh, or melena, and then the hydration status may vary. For diagnosis, provided that the baby is stable, you can get an abdominal x-ray. Like I said, that typically shows a double bubble sign, as well as maybe some distal air fluid levels. This needs to be followed up by an upper GI contrast series or a contrast enema, uh, and that's going to really help you determine whether or not there's a volvulus there. Uh, but it certainly will uh, confirm uh, if there's malrotation. So as far as imaging uh, for malrotation and volvulus, if the baby has an intestinal obstruction uh, but no signs of volvulus, so they've got the, the signs of obstruction like vomiting and distension, but they don't have a fever, they don't have any red stools or black stools, uh, then the common finding is to see contrast uh, and dilated bowel on the right side only. Uh, and that's because that's where most of the bowel, or most of the small bowel is. If there's volvulus, uh, then the signs of volvu volvulus would be that uh, fever, bloody stools, along with obstruction. Uh, the common finding is to see a corkscrew appearance or a bird's beak appearance uh, with very scant contrast distally, and that's because of the twisting. Volvulus just means twisting. So I'll show you a picture. So here's male rotation, no volvulus here. And what you can see here, here's your stomach, and then here's your duodenum. 
and your duodenum should come ar when your duodenum crosses the midline it should come around like this and go back under the stomach see like right like right here you got your stomach and then your duodenum makes this sort of C uh, and crosses back uh, under the midline and back to the left hand side of the body but that doesn't happen here the duodenum is coming down here and it's not really getting back down under the midline it's pretty much st everything staying to the right here you can see see it even more. The duodenum is coming down here, and rather than curving back underneath the stomach, you've got a lot of bowel here to the right. So hopefully I've made that clear. Now here's a volvulus. So with this volvulus here, you see very scant contrast distally, and you also see this twisting here. So this is where your volvulus is, right here. And it's, this is the bird's beak appearance. And you can see there's a little bit of contrast coming down, and then it's pooled here too. But this is where your, your twisting is, and you're going to, if you were to do surgery on this baby, which you obviously should do, uh, you're going to have a, an obstructed superior mesenteric artery. And that's the reason why we have to get this untwisted. And that's why this is an emergency. This is going to be something that gets... Uh, if the, the pediatric surgeon is on call and they're sleeping or watching Star Trek in their call room, this is going to wake them up and get them uh, running down to the OR. Management is going to be an emergent pediatric surgery consultation. Uh, you need to get uh, either LADS procedure done if it's just malrotation, uh, or if it's volvulus, you'll need to do LADS procedure and resection of any dead bowel. Uh, you'll probably need to do a second look in 24 to 48 hours. You want to be conservative on how much dead bowel, or how much bowel you resect. If it just looks kind of red and inflamed, you don't want to be cutting out a whole lot of bowel. You want to kind of sit and wait on it, and then in a couple days, uh, you'll go in and look again. If it, if it looks okay after a couple days, then you can leave it. Uh, but if it if it looks bad after a couple days, you'll want to take it out. So you want to be conservative on removing bowel, but if it definitely looks ischemic and dead, remove it right away. Uh, you you definitely want to have these babies on IV antibiotics if they have volvulus or any ischemia, and these babies should be in the PICU or in the NICU.